Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, International Women's Day Speak Easy. Uh, on behalf of my co-founder, Jane Sachs and I, we are so delighted that you have joined us today of all days. And um, we are also so excited to welcome Michelle Duster and Melissa Potter. Um, if this is your first uh, entree into Speakeasy, you've picked a really good one to start with. Um, this is the one that we focus on feminist practices, feminisms, how feminism influences our lives, how we use it personally, professionally, and in all of our advocacy work and, and our passions. Um, so today we are joined live by Michelle and Melissa, but we're also featuring video contributions from three other amazing feminists, Jeffrey Hayes, E. Patrick Johnson, and Mega Ramaswamy. We're going to do uh, further introductions shortly and an intro to the program, but first we're gonna do a little bit of housekeeping uh, to make everything nice and easy for you all to use who have joined us today. So first of all, this program will be recorded so um, you can watch it later, you can share it with other people, you'll be able to find it on YouTube and you'll have that link mailed directly to you. You'll also be able to find it on um, our website afterwards. So we are here to converse with the people we've invited on and to hear from you. So we always save time for questions and answers at the end. And um, that's where we want you to, to provide your questions, right in that Q&A tool. So we're going to have chat enabled for the whole conversation and you'll see we're going to be sharing lots of resources and links to things that we're talking about for further information for you but when it gets time to q a when my colleague jane Sachs takes over we really want you to use that tool because that's where we'll pull questions from and that's um a tool right in the bottom of your your zoom screen also live transcription is enabled today if you'd like to use that tool so if, uh, if this is also your introduction to um, Monuments to Movement, it's a little bit about us. We are an international expansive organization that envisions, develops, and commissions public art work that monumentalizes movement making and collective action. We offer a new vision and an evolving process that is not just inclusive of the world's diversity, but also paradigm shifting, feminist, and centered in restorative justice. Monuments to Movements believes that monuments should elevate collective action, not hero worship, and we create conditions that support a more humane and just world. And we do all of this work within an intersectional feminist framework. So Monuments to Movements is a small staff, along with Jane and myself, the co-founders and co-artistic directors. We have Marcella Andrade, our operations strategist, who works on everything with us. And we're very excited this week to welcome our fourth new staff member, Arya Malik, who is our digital media director. Also behind the scenes is our Zoom tech, Kelsey Bogdan, also a fantastic artist. So I am so grateful for our team and, and helping us put this together today. Beyond this tiny staff, we also are part of an expansive international group of movement builders. To learn more about them, just go to our website. There's a page about movement builders and you can read all about this group that we work with. Um, so uh, today, again, our third speakeasy, and it's the only one so far that hasn't been connected to a specific monument initiative. Rather, this conversation is the essential conversation that is foundational to all the other work we do at M2M, and that is feminist practices. So we wanted to provide a really quick statement about how we define feminism and how we expand the idea of feminism and how we expand the terminology around feminism or womanism or intersectional feminism or however you identify it. We also acknowledge the exclusions of the past and the current exclusions that we all work against, where some voices are drowned out by others. Our M2M -M feminism has no single author, is global in consideration, amplifies undertold stories, and is inclusive of all intersections, experiences, and perspectives of gender, race, ethnicity, class, culture, ability, and more. 
Our full statement on feminism can be found on our website. And your engagement in this program today will further inform our framework and the many ways that we can expand it. So I get to introduce our um, our speakers today, and um, we're going to do a super quick intros for them because we want to get right into their work and our conversation together. So links to their full bios are going to be in the chat so you can read all about them. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, we know so many incredible feminist thinkers and workers, and many of you are with us today. And um, as we continue these conversations around feminism, we will bring in more and more people. However, Michelle and Melissa are probably two of our favorites. Um, Jane and I have both worked with Michelle and Melissa quite a, quite a lot over the past, past years or decades, actually. And their work has inspired us and informed us and um, really fueled the really the ways that we have built monuments to movements. And um, I want to thank them personally for being such huge supporters of, of my work and the work we do with M to M and also really teaching us how we can think more expansively and more inclusively. So quick little bios here. Michelle Duster is a writer, educator, and advocate for racial and gender equity in public history. She's been involved in several public art projects, including historical markers and a national monument to her great grandmother, Ida B. Wells, as well as a pair of large scale murals commemorating Chicago area suffrage leaders. Melissa Hilliard Potter is a feminist, interdisciplinary artist, writer, and curator who works to protect, interpret, and archive endangered women's handicrafts through the medium of gardens. She's also a professor of book and paper at Columbia College, Chicago. So um, we're going to go into their two brief presentations um, right now. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you, uh, Nisa and Jane, for including me in this um, program, which is apropos for it to be on International Women's Day. Um, and it also happens to be the day, which we never expected, <laughs> um, to be the day after this anti-lynching, um, Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act bill passed, which my great grandmother was very involved in, um, and speaking out against lynching and helping this country understand what was really going on when it came to um, this brutal and lawless and mob-induced act um, that was really domestic terrorism. And so um, I guess it's just meant to be that, <laughs> that we would be talking about um, monuments. Uh, well, I'm, I've been focusing on making sure that my great grandmother is remembered and celebrated um, and, and honored by this country for what she contributed. Um, but to me, what I've been doing is bigger than my great grandmother, which might sound like, how is that possible? Um, but um, she worked you know, for her whole life on, on issues. And some of the issues that she was working on, we're still grappling with. Um, so to me, it's more about uh, focusing on what her focus, what her point was with her work and how um, and how we um, continue on with, with her legacy and her um, focus to make our country what it should be, what it can be. Um, so I've been working to make my great grandmother visible, but also her contemporaries and other people who were working in her vein. So Next um, slide, I'm just gonna be talking about, um, so over a really quick overview of the work that my great grandmother did, which is expansive. It's amazing that one person could do all of this in one lifetime, plus have four children and be a wife. Um, I don't know how she did that, um, but she started her career as an educator. She segued into journalism, and then she used her journalism as a form of activism in order to expose the atrocities and the horrors of lynching um, in order to, um, you know, get this country to have um, 
full, full rights, full citizenship for African Americans um, in this country. She uh, eventually became a co-owner and an editor of the newspaper, the Memphis Free Speech. Um, and she used the work that she was doing to um, engage in civil rights activism. She used the power of the press in order to, to do that. Um, eventually she became one of the co-founders of the NAACP and a co-founder of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Um, both of those organizations obviously were working for civil rights activism and full citizenship for um, African Americans and women. Um, she was one of the found, she was the founder of the Alpha Suffrage Club, um, which was an all-black um, suffrage organization located in Chicago um, in her quest to fight for the right for women to have the right to vote. Um, and she got involved in a lot of local issues here in Chicago, um, which were around housing and education. Um, and she did what some people consider today to be social work, which was providing housing and um, job placement for Southern migrants who were coming to Chicago from the South around the World War I. Um, so <clears throat> that's very a brief overview of, of the work that she did. And so I'm going to talk next um, slide about the, the work that I've been doing to um, help people remember her and recognize where we are today. Um, we're, st we're all standing on shoulders and, and we need to, as a country, and it's so crucial now more than ever, for us to recognize our history and talk about what really happened in this country and so we can understand where we are today. Um, so the first uh, tribute and, and the only tribute for decades um, in Chicago to my great grandmother's work were the Ida B. Wells Homes, which was a public housing community that opened in 1941. And it was um, standing on the south side of Chicago in the Bondsville neighborhood until it started to be torn down in 2002. Um, and that was really the most uh, prominent um, tribute to her in the city of Chicago outside of her home that was a, a national landmark. But once the homes started coming down, the Ida B. Wells Homes um, public housing project, I felt very strongly along with several other people in my family that the city of Chicago owed her. Um, some kind of tribute for all that she contributed, not only to the city of Chicago, but to, to the country and to the world. So I started uh, working on some projects that would help people remember her. So in the next slide, I'll show you um, an example of one project that's a, um, this project, what I, I started working on a committee uh, called the Ida B. Wells Commemorative Art Committee in 2008 um, to have a monument created in um, in honor of my great grandmother. And um, it was a very complicated pro project, which required a lot of fundraising for me. I had never done anything like this before. Um, and so the budget was $300,000. And at first I thought it wouldn't be that hard. Like who wouldn't want to honor my great grandmother and $300,000 didn't seem like that much if you think about it from a city standpoint, but it started to be very, very tough to raise that kind of money. And so I went to Alderman King in the fourth ward and asked that we have a smaller project um, created, which I thought might uh, create momentum and just to have something completed. Also, I wanted to make sure that we would remember that the housing community, which there's not one brick left, um, would be recognized and remembered. It was such a substantial uh, location in the city of Chicago on the south side. And so I just merely asked to have this small marker placed at 37th and King Drive, which is on the corner that what, where there was a sign that said, welcome to Ida B. Wells Homes. And so I felt that was so significant. And we're in a process of plan of transformation where you know re urban development, whatever way you wanna uh, refer to, basically a lot of changes happening in different communities around the city and actually around the country. And there's a, a form of erasure that happens when um, there's this sort of gentrification. And so I did not want there to be erasure of the community of the Ida B. Wells homes. Um, and also I asked for an honorary street name um, so that whenever there's all, a whole, all of this new development in the neighborhood, 
people would be forced to remember that Ida B. Wells was such a significant player in that neighborhood. Her house is about a half a block away from this street. So um, if you ever get a chance to go to 37 King Drive and you can uh, get a closer look at this marker, you can see that there's like an etching of the housing community information about the housing community, that there were over 1,600 units, um, that it was from King Drive to Cottage Grove from 37th to 39th. So, I mean, it was a very significant housing community. Um, so then the next slide, I um, worked on, this is the monument. It took 13 years from 2008 until it was installed last summer. Um, July, June 30th specifically, which was significant because Ida B. Wells' birthday is July 16th. And so we were trying to get it as close to her birthday as possible. Um, so this monument was, is on the land where the Ida B. Wells homes were. And uh, those of us on the committee were insistent that be the case because why would it be anywhere else in the city besides where the homes were that were named after her also, it's very close to her house that she actually lived in and the community she spent her entire adult life in Chicago in. So we felt very strongly that this needed to be in that space, on that land. Um, so Richard Hunt was the um, artist who created this monument and we wanted it to be abstract and interpretive because as you heard earlier, my great grandmother was very multifaceted and we felt we didn't even want to try to choose one pose of her to make a statue. We wanted a monument so that people could interpret who she was based on what they bring to the, the work. Um, but we also had uh, panels installed inside of those pillars that have different images of her so that, you know, it's, it's a way to incorporate her image without it being life-size kind of statue. And we also have the ability to incorporate some of her quotes. She was a writer and she was, had a lot of very famous quotes um, and a short bio of her. And so this is um, really, um, our hope is that this will be a national monument. We named it the Ida B. Wells National Monument um, and with the hope that it will literally have a national presence because she was a national figure and she needs to be recognized in her own community. Um, so next slide. Um, so here's Ida B. Wells Drive. I've been on a mission. <laughs> Um, to make sure that people remember her. This actually came out of an initi initiative that was um, started by the League of Women Voters, actually. Um, and there was this push to have, it's a long story, and I guess we can get into it in the Q&A, um, but there was originally an idea to have Belvo replaced with a woman's name, and Ida B. Wells was the first and only woman that was suggested. Um, but then eventually through a bunch of uh, controversy, we ended up um, quote settling for Congress Parkway <laughs> to be renamed to Ida B. Wells Drive, which actually, which actually ended up being a much bigger street that um, feeds into two different interstates, I-94 and I-290. Um, and so to me, that is an example I have, have taken that um, situation that happened with the street as sometimes, you know, you, you experience, um, you know, you experience barriers to having what you originally want to have happen. And then ultimately something bigger and better happens. Um, and so that's exactly what happened. This was passed in by a city council in 2018. And then the signage actually went up in uh, February 11, 2019. Um, this is the first street in downtown Chicago still to this day to be named after any woman at all and any person of color at all. Um, and so this is very significant um, presence of a woman being in, in our, our um, dialogue in our in our the inner part of our who our city is. Um, and so next slide. I um, I was not personally involved with having this marker uh, created, but there's an initiative by the um, Pomeroy Foundation to have. 
um, markers placed around the country, 2,000 markers to commemorate um, suffrage sites. And so um, my, the, the site where my great grandmother's Alpha Suffrage Club met, which was at the Negro Fellowship League at 3005 South State Street at the time, um, is that's the location that was being recognized. Um, so we got as close as we could. This marker is at 31st in state, which is on IIT's campus. Um, and so this is also very significant as showing that black women were involved in the suffrage movement, very much so, and they were leaders in the suffrage movement. And so finally, um, we are as a country starting to recognize that and um, give uh, tributes to these African-American and other women of color who were involved in the suffrage movement who had previously been very much erased or marginalized in even the telling of the history, let alone what, what they went through during the suffrage movement. So we are making progress as far as making sure that these women get recognized um, in, in our um, all of our materials, but in public spaces, I think it's very important because a lot of people are not going to go to archives or watch documentary films or whatever, other things that maybe some more academic, people in the academic world might do. So having this information in public spaces that people can easily access when they're just walking down the street, um, I think is very vital in order to making sure that this history is known and recognized. Um, so next slide. Um, and so this project was even huger, <laughs> much more huge. <laughs> um, I, I came up with this idea to have a mural created in Chicago to recognize a local suffragist because there were several projects that were happening around the country um, with the idea of them being installed or completed in 2020, which was the centennial of the 19th Amendment. And what I saw happening in other parts of the country um, I thought they were important and obviously they need to be done in order to recognize some of the leaders of the suffrage movement. But I felt very strongly that the suffrage movement was not about one or two or three women. It was a movement of thousands of women over almost a hundred years. And so how can you capture that kind of history by only showing one or two women? Um, and so I tried to think of ways that Chicago could be a little different than some other cities that I saw doing work um, and have a more sort of inclusive uh, way of recognizing these women and show this collective action um, and generational, multi-generational work. Um, and so I, I thought that maybe we can do this in a mural versus um, other forms of public artwork. Um, with the idea that you can show multiple people. Um, I originally thought we could, you know, have wording, um, you know, text and things like that in order to kind of tell the story. Um, and so I pitched the idea to several people and we assembled a committee called the Chicago Women's uh, Suffrage Tribute Committee. And we um, at this particular wall, which is at, it happens to be 33 East Ida B. Wells Drive is the actual address, but it faces um, Harrison on six, 700 South, uh, five, 600 South, and it's on Wabash. And um, so this is what we came up with. Um, Diosa, who is her government name or real name is um, Jasmina Kazuku. Um, is the one who did the artwork. And there was another part of this project that um, we, we are still working on um, to recognize the, how far women have come since 1920. And we're giving a tribute to Kamala Harris, who we know stands on shoulders. And she knows she stands on shoulders. She stands on the shoulders of these women who worked so hard so that almost exactly 100 years after the 19th Amendment was passed, Kamala Harris was elected as vice president. Um, so we want to rec see that continuum um, from 1920 to 2020 um, on how far not only women, but African-American women um, have come in this country when it comes to political empowerment. Um, so next slide. And so to conclude, um, what I'm doing um, in, in recognizing and helping um, push my, my great grandmother's legacy and work to the forefront in our country's history, this telling of the story of what the United States 
is and has been. Um, to me is bigger, like I said, than, than my great grandmother alone. I feel very strongly that it's important to put her into historical context and put her into um, positions of making sure that, she, that people know that she worked in collective, in collective ways with other people. Um, and so we as Black women have been part of this country for over 400 years and we have 400 years of history that need to be recognized. Um, and we need to be recognized in all aspects of our society, including public artwork. And that's what my, my goal and hope is. So thank you very much. And I'm sure Mel will add more. Just want to make sure the screen is up and everything look good, Michelle. Can you see? Can you yes. hear me? Cool. Okay, great. Um, I just want to start quickly by thanking Jane and Nisa, of course, and also Michelle. Michelle is someone who obviously has transformed the way I think about feminism, but also my classroom. I have a specific module on the uh, genesis of the Ida B. Wells monument. So thank you so much for that. Um, it was Jane and Nisa who actually helped me conceptualize the garden as a monument, obviously, but it was not something that occurred to me originally. This is an image from Columbia Sh uh, College Chicago, the first major garden um, where I worked. And because I'm talking about the land, I want to briefly give what I um, have described as a feminist land acknowledgement. I want to pay particular homage to um, the indigenous communities of Chicagoland, but specifically to the Potawatomi Black Ash basket makers who have been critical in my understanding of the land, climate change, and women's craft. This is an image of the uh, paper maker's garden in its heyday. I um, started thinking about why gardens are a feminist practice. And I uh, came up with so many different reasons. Of course, first they carry ethnographic and biological histories of their use, which many of which are women-centric. They represent the full life cycle, which is anti-patriarchal. They uh, embrace the full cycle along with death and regeneration. They are natural collaborators and companions. They're a monument to their predecessors from whom they come. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with the incredible Mexican proverb, they thought they could bury us, they didn't know we were seeds. It's one of my favorites in terms of invisible labors of plants. Um, this is an image uh, from the, Lur the Lurie Garden here in Chicago. The prairie itself are natural re rewilding agents. They're built to spread, they're built to connect, to distribute, to replicate. They also have root systems that are the greatest monument to our biome. They're invisible. They work for up to four years in order to come up ground. And in so doing, they do all of this incredible unrecognized work of carbon remediation and generation. This is an example of, of uh, the project I have, uh, Season Service with Maggie Puckett. This is our life cycle from seed to sheet, where we go from planting to harvesting uh, to collecting. We try to follow the natural cycle of the earth in our process in making paper and art from the plants that we produce. And I wanted to highlight an example of how we use gardens to amplify women's histories. This is a project I did. The Papermaker's Garden is right at Plymouth um, and what was, um, to, excuse me, State and Wabash and what was 8th Street. Um, this is a wage, wage map uh, from the Jane Addams Hall House. All of the white blocks are brothels. Um, and we realized that, that this was adjacent to the Papermaker's Garden. I think it's a radical concept of sex work as work long before we had uh, that nomenclature. And so I researched records of women who existed in these brothels, most of whom were of course completely erased. I was able to come up with four names and I designed, I designed a seed packet for distribution with these histories. It animated a long-term conversation on my blog, which was um, uh, an ancillary to this. The conversation ranged from anti-pornography feminism to the racist white slavery anti-prostitution movement, which grew out of, um, of this time period as well. This is an example of a menu card we used for a um, performative dinner party about these histories. 
This um, testimony was the first migrant farmer woman on record to testify about her sexual assault in the field where she worked, Rosario E. Um, we uh, created another sort of monument to the work that we did, which was a book called An Illuminated Feminist Seed Bank. Um, it cataloged five years of our um, working together and it animated a lot of histories about the gardens. This one is the uh, war garden propagating plants from wars. Um, it also animated a very special history for me, a Bosnian refugee I sponsored during the Bosnian War in the 90s, who I was reunited with on her land back in Bosnia in 2015. The project was inspired by the plants that she decided to grow, one of the first choices she made when she got her land back after she had been a refugee for many years. Uh, this is an image of a public program. Um, we did many of them at the site. I uh, worked with Tatiana Jovancevic, who was a Bosnian living here in, Ch in Chicago to curate the plants uh, uh, for medicine and teas that came from her own family history. And then ultimately this work and sort of, I think one of the more interesting ideas of a monument, the Global Seed Vault itself is a monument to these, uh, to these histories, to these ideas. And as part of the work of the Global Seed Vault, they invited artists to inter their artwork interpreting the seeds in the mountain alongside the sea bank. And so I think of this as sort of this ongoing movement um, to animate the histories of, of women in particular, which is what I, of course, am very devoted to, but also the untold histories of people working with the land, something we take so incredibly for granted, particularly at this moment of climate crisis. So that was just a really brief um, charade I wanted to share with you. And um, I thank you so much again for the opportunity to speak and to be with you today. Thank you so much, Mel and Michelle. Um, we're going to transition really quickly to um, our videos. Um, so we asked three of our esteemed and, and favorite colleagues to talk a little bit about what feminist practice looks like in their work and in their lives. So we're going to hear from Jeffreen Hayes, Three Walls Executive Director and Curator, E. Patrick Johnson, Dean of, at Northwestern University and a scholar and performer, and Mega Ramaswamy, Population Health Professor at University of Kansas. So let's watch these now. My first exposure to feminism actually came through my grandmother, who was a live-in domestic worker. I ended up writing my dissertation about my grandmother's experience of being a live-in domestic. And what her life taught me was that feminism, even though she wouldn't have called it that, was necessarily intersectional. It intersected with her race, with her class, uh, and with her sexuality. And those lessons really influenced how I um, do my work as an artist, as a scholar, and as a leader. One of the ways uh, that those things manifest um, through my scholarship is um, collaborations with Black women. One of the first collaborations I had was um, with um, a, a group of Black artists, uh, Black women artists, uh, to create an anthology that I co-edited with my colleague Ramon Rivera Severa called Solo Black Woman, which is a uh, anthology that brings together the scripts, essays, and interviews of Black women artists. The more recent project that I've been working on or that I finished is uh, an oral history project of Black queer Southern women uh, that uh, is in the form of two different books, a, a traditional oral history book and a um, creative nonfiction book. And so uh, one of the reasons why I think it's important for projects like um, M2M uh, to be in the world is that it demonstrates that monuments don't necessarily have to be a, a statue erected in a public place, but it can be an archival 
embodiment, um, such as a play or an anthology or what have you. Um, and those kinds of embodied monuments or archives can lead to very important social movements. And I think that the intersectionality of uh, feminism, uh, whatever those intersections might be, whether it be class, whether it be race, uh, or all of the above, um, is important to understand and really um, demonstrates through M2M um, how uh, fem intersectional feminist practice uh, can move us literally and psychologically from one state to another for the social good. My name is Mega Ramaswamy and I'm a professor of population health at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. I'm here today to talk to you about what feminist practice looks like in public health work. I specifically work with women who are leaving the criminal legal system. On any given day, there are about 1 million women under some sort of criminal legal supervision in this country, whether they're in jails, in prisons, or under some sort of community supervision like probation or parole. Women who have criminal legal system experiences bear a burden of poverty, low education, low employment access opportunities, housing instability, not to mention long histories of trauma around child, physical, and sexual violence, and intimate partner violence. Women who become incarcerated are disproportionately affected by mental health problems and substance use problems. We use incarceration as a de facto method of structural racism in this country. The criminal legal system is made up of people who are disproportionately black and brown. And so one must take an intersectional lens when thinking about the context in which women end up in the system, their gender, their race, their class, their interactions with the state, whether that's with the foster care system or the criminal legal system, and their unique positionality in American society. So I develop public health interventions for women in the system, which means that we try to talk to women in jails and as they're leaving about their health. And in my case, it's women's health. It's cervical cancer prevention, breast cancer prevention, sexually transmitted infection prevention, and reproductive goal planning. So what does that look like? Well, number one, we reject status quo assumptions about women. We meet women where they're at. When we go into jails, we frequently say to women, this is a no judgment zone. We listen to women's voices, we think about their own experiences, we take a trauma-informed lens to the way they're talking about their health issues, and we treat women as experts of their own lives. Secondly, we leverage social capital frameworks to think about how women can help each other. With reference to women being the experts of their own lives, we have found that when we work with women, they know how to navigate health resources. They know where to get bus rides. They know who the best doctors are. They know where you might get arrested in an emergency room. And that is information that other women can use. And so we think about the women we work with as having tremendous amounts of a certain kind of social capital that can help other women in their same circumstance navigate resources, avoid further criminal legal system involvement, and just lead to better health and social lives. As I said, we also sort of take an intersectional lens um, when we're thinking about how women move through the world. We are always paying attention to dynamics of race and class. And when we think about health, we think about it in context, right? So how does health unfold given lots of homelessness, given active drug use, given limited access to health and mental health care? The criminal legal system in the United States has really become a method of treating mental health problems and drug problems. And let me tell you that is not their function and they don't necessarily do it well. It is an inappropriate response to the circumstances with which women find themselves in the criminal legal system in the first place. So when I think about feminist practice in this context, I am really thinking about appreciating that women are the experts of their own lives, number one. Number two, I am thinking about women as being able to help other women, leveraging their own unique social capital. And number three, I'm taking an intersectional lens, thinking about how women's unique position in terms of race, class, gender, affects their ultimate health and their ability to take care of their health and have um, good, happy lives. Thank you. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Hayes, and 
When I think about feminist practices, I think about it from the point of view as a Black woman, I consider myself a Black feminist who puts it into practice in all areas of my life. And when I think about what it looks like in my work, uh, whether it's leading three walls or curating or even mentoring, I think about it through the terms of care. And so for me, it looks like love, it looks like transparency, it looks like vulnerability, it looks like intimacy, and it looks like accountability. And I believe that these are all acts of care that truly come from a, a place of feminism. It comes from a place that I have witnessed in my own life with the Black women who are part of my life. And I believe that these acts of care are integral to relationship building. And it is about being in relationship to each other. And the acts are also helping to illuminate how we are interdependent and how do we get to a place of interdependency that is not extractive, that is not uh, connected to harm and trauma, if we move from this place of care, again, thinking about love and transparency, intimacy, vulnerability and accountability, and engage in acts of exchange with these, these um, intentional ways of being, these values, and reciprocate, it really does lead to a generative place of uh, where the projects can leave a morsel or two of good behind rather than extraction and uh, harm. And so that's what it looks like to me. That's what I've seen. That's what I've experienced in many, uh, projects that really do center or come from a place of uh, feminism. Thank you all. Um, I just want to remind everybody to uh, turn off their mute and put on their videos on the panel. I just want one quick thing, which is that we will stay about 10 minutes over. Um, and we thank both of you for being able to do that, as well as everybody on the M2M team. Um, so put your questions in the Q&A if you can't stay, and we'll try to answer them all, and you can listen to the, the last couple minutes um, of the recording. I just want to reemphasize that our feminism is gender inclusive, identity inclusive, uh, recognizes a plurality of different feminisms. It's about a humane, just, creative world. And I think from the videos you can see, it's it's holistic. It's about mind, body, intellect, soul, spirit, um, and community. Um, so I just wanna do some short reflections on the videos and then invite, um, Mal and invite Mal and Michelle to briefly comment or weave them into your answers as we go along. But, you know, Mega really talks about being agents and experts of our own lives. And imagine if um, what the past and the present would be like if, if that actually were true. And if female identified and um, women identified would be in those roles and have that kind of power um, in their lives. And I think it's it's part of what we're all working towards. Jeffreen talks about a feminism as a culture and life practice and social political organizing as acts of care. And so she speaks about intersectionality of love, transparency, intimacy, vulnerability, accountability, and that these are fundamental acts in relationship and exchange. 
and are generative. It's not something that has a period on it. It's actually one of those great gifts that keep on giving rather than some of those others. Um, e. Patrick, you know, he really talks about a legacy of intersectional feminism, you know, not necessarily in language and identification. You know, his grandmother lived intersectional feminism before it was a named concept. Um, and it really was about race and class and gender. And she passed that on to her grandson, her grandson who would base his scholarship, his artistic practice and his leadership um, and his life's work on um, that living model. Um, and really he talks about how that moves us literally and psychologically. So I really can't thank our contributors enough for adding even more nuance and dimension and layers um, to what we're talking about today. So I just invite you, Melissa and Michelle, if you wanna briefly comment on those videos, and then we can kind of move to some more questions and we'll also be pulling up questions from the Q&A chat. Well, one additional thing um, I found uh, really thought provoking um, in Jeff Reen's was this idea that um, a practice can be harmful or helpful, this idea that, um, that our whole society is really extractive. I loved the use of that word. Um, and of course, that could be quite literal in terms of extracting the land, but it also can be extracting of one another, of others' labor, of others' beings. And so I was really... Um, I was really uh, interested to hear her use that word and I wrote it down, one that I think that I will continue to use. And then of course, um, there was questions about invisible experience, you know, the, the experience of a domestic worker whose narrative is, is rarely if ever shared and um, public health and all of these um, things that women experience um, in their lives that we end up blaming them for, like drug addiction, like um, lack of ability to care for their children. I found that really powerful too. And thinking about how a practice um, also seeks to rigorously question that which is invisible um, from the public eye. So I found them all really thought provoking. Michelle, do you want to add anything now? Um, I would just quickly add um, that overall, the the sort of message that I got or the, the, the thoughts that sort of resonated with me were just the idea of ownership over your own story, over your own narrative, and over your own life. Um, you know, and so... Um, and I, I mean, I think we're still struggling with that today for, for women to um, be able to have agency over, over their own um, trajectory in life. And sort of the idea of criminalization of, of victimhood. <laughs> um, and, and so that, that sort of theme runs through a lot of the work that I've been studying for a while. Um, you know, that, that people are sort of blamed for their own situation in life and then criminalized for what they have to do in order to navigate those lives. And um, that, that we live in a society that, that is very um, punitive versus um, restorative. And, and, and uh, so, um, you know, and so these these people in these in situations are are sort of marked as voiceless and powerless when they actually do have power. Um, and so, you know, giving them the power to um, speak for themselves, I think, is what I personally feel is very important. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more um, with both of you. I think the idea of of agency and um, and being the kind of experts of our lives. And that doesn't mean experts because we get everything right, but we also have a chance to experiment, uh, risk, make mistakes, learn, right? I mean, that's also part of the power 
of an equitable society, right? Who gets to actually be really engaged in a process of kind of their human capacity? You know, I wanna talk something that, that really came out in your presentations and really leads to a question that Nisa and I had is, you know, it, both of your work is really about kind of multiple lives and incarnations of your practice, figure, you know, figuratively, metaphorically, actually. I mean, even if you look at kind of the roadway name for Ida B. Wells is really about the tributaries of justice, right? And how it connects in a map of our world, right? And Mao, you know, of course, the kind of incarnations of seeds and growing and land, right? And um, so I wanted you to each talk a little bit about your practice and really like, what does feminism and feminist lenses, tools, strategies look like to you? And, and why do you value those tools and perspectives to do the work that you wanna do? And of course, you know, why are those values that should be applied, baked in to public art and public space? Just a couple ideas. <laughs> well, I, I can I can just answer really quickly. Um, I, the approach that I've taken to a lot of the work that I've done has been in the form of committees, um, and and to me that's very important in involving the community uh, because I I really feel that even though um, I am a, a descendant of Ida B. Wells and she's you know, a family member, um, I don't feel that, um, that uh, you know, she is about our family specifically, she's about the community and a, about the, the, the country and what she gave to this country. And, and so I feel very important, I feel that it's very important to involve um, community members in having a say, having input into what goes into their own community. Um, and so with the Ida B. Wells Monument in particular, um, there were several people on the committee who were former residents of the Ida B. Wells homes. Um, when we first started the committee, my father and I um, served on the committee as well for a while until he wasn't until he passed away. Um, but we actually went to meetings in the community, to churches, to different community meetings, and talked with people who live there in that community. I don't live in that community. I'm, I'm from Chicago, but I don't live in that exact neighborhood. And so I knew that I would maybe be considered an outsider. And so I felt it was very important to have buy-in and have um, ownership and, and feel that there's some input you know, from people who actually live there. And the same thing with several other you know, projects that I mentioned. I mean, the, the mural um, that, that I worked on, we didn't go to community people in, in downtown, but um, there was a collaborative approach to how we decided who would be included on the mural um, and with taking into a lot of different things into consideration. Um, and so that to me, that's what's important is that it's not just like a, this dictatorship of from top down kind of thing. It's from, you know, inclusivity um, and community engagement. Yeah, I, I also am a huge proponent of collaboration. Um, I mean, it's not just that I value it, it's that it's a necessity. So I feel that um, one of the things as a society we have to come to terms with is that we've created this individualistic monolith of a society and it's failed. It's a failed contract. I mean, except perhaps for the 2%, but I'd argue it even fails for them spiritually, psychologically, and emotionally. Um, Vandana Shiva, the great echo feminist um, scientist, um, said, believes that we have a future where women lead or we will not have a future. And that's not, um, I don't believe that as sort of an essentialist argument. I believe that is that we have literally marginalized 50 plus percent of the world's population from accessing basic needs and for partic from participation in a civil society. So, you know, that feminism is really the only way forward. I don't, you know, again, I don't see it as something that's a choice. I also don't see um, collaboration as a choice. We, we do this together or we don't. 
Um, and of course, a garden is teaches you that, that from ground up. You're collaborating with the earth, of course, but the labor of working at scale for farming gardening is a collective practice. So um, yeah, I definitely echo the, the uh, collaborative aspect of, of feminist practice for movement building. Well, what you're both talking about really is, you know, at the core of monuments to movements, right? There are no movements without collective action and, and commitment and um, various roles and perspectives, right? And so, you know, these are not things that are done alone. There are some things we can do alone and some things that absolutely must be done collectively. Um, and so we can't build a just and equitable world alone, right? You know, um, and so I think, you know, part of what you're talking about is a relationship between movement building and feminism is essential. Um, and could you describe in a little bit more detail what that looks like, um, you know, in terms of narrative change, visibility, you know, inclusion, like what are the principles that relate movement building and feminism, including communal acts? I mean, I think um, one of the one of the techniques that I find really important when, when animating these undertold stories is distribution. And it's something that I'm always sort of challenging myself on. You know, I think artists have a tendency to, to publish a lot of materials that don't effectively become distributed. I think about Michelle's practice of writing and how this is a natural um, distribution tactic for this critical information and material and, and maybe that's why for me personally I've gravitated to curatorial and writing work because it's a natural way to distribute um, the information and then I you know I think for me I argue about ephemerality uh, as a form of um, acceptance and feminism but then you know I sit here with Michelle and think about how essential it is that Ida B. Wells monument is permanent so you know I think that there are uh, um, a variety of strategies that work for different um, for different things but minimally the idea that um, these these stories and narratives have to be distributed beyond sort of a local level I think is critical um, yeah, I'd love to hear Michelle's thoughts on that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think about when it comes to my great grandmother's life, and I think about how she was involved in the Black um, Club Women's Movement, um, which was obviously a very collective way of um, addressing um, issues that affected women um, in general and Black women specifically. Um, so this idea of collective action um, feels like we, we have a long history of that. And I think it's, it probably is because of the way our, our society, and I'm sure maybe other societies around the world, are set up where women in, traditionally have not been in major um, seats of power. And so in order to have power, there has to be a collective um, way of organizing together in order to have um, a voice that, that can um, sort of combat, you know, the, combat the, the male dominated <laughs> um, seats of power. And, and so I think historically, um, from a necessary standpoint, women have um, a longer tradition uh, of working together in groups um, in order to mobilize, in order to affect change. And, and so that to me is sort of a tradition um, that, that comes along with just the reality of being women of being, you know, female identifying people that, um, you know, I think that happens a lot of times when you're part of any kind of marginalized group, you have to have collective action, in, because as an individual, you're sort of drowned out. Um, so, you, so you have to build coalitions in order to make things happen. Wonderful. Let me ask you another question briefly, you know, to kind of answer it briefly. 
I still haven't gotten uh, reading all the incoming messages um, on Zoom. I probably haven't gotten it right on, in life either. But so then I'm going to ask you guys a question. And then uh, after you briefly answer it, I'll ask a, a question from the attendees, our, our comrades, I'll say. Um, so I just wanted to, to have you talk a little bit about why it's important that you're part of m m right? And, and coming in, you know, with a, a feminist practice and, and really looking at it that way. And then also, you know, why should artists and cultural workers, you know, and, and social justice workers adapt, adapt feminist frameworks to producing work or doing that work, which is not necessarily related to feminism or gender equity. It is a framework of being and a philosophy and a way of living um, that's not just kind of in one lane. So one, your role and why you wanna be part of M2M and then that question. And then I'm gonna take this great question um, from the audience. And again, it's a couple minutes after one. Um, so if you can answer those and then we can move to other stuff because we know we have. I mean, I can go right for the M to M, which is that, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I mean, I, I hadn't thought of a garden as a monument. And of course now I've completely transformed my ideas around that. Um, I mean, I think that uh, M to M on so many levels is, first of all, extremely timely because now is the moment we need to totally rethink public space on so many levels. I mean, from climate crisis to public space to our cities post pandemic to Black Lives Matter to, you know, the crisis, so many crises of, of um, human involvement. Of course, I think about Ukraine right now. Um, but uh, I think what's been interesting for me, just on a, a personal level in thinking about monuments um, is that certain types of work as a, as a feminist become humble almost by default. And this is a real issue. I mean, I think even of like Gloria Steinem at, at, um, at Ms or something, you know, you, oh, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes work. And M to M with this idea of the monument in a lot of different iterations, I think has helped me kind of scale things up again towards this idea of distribution but thinking, you know, how can all of this uh, collective work that's happening, how can all of this work that in many cases is behind the scenes become public and transformative? And, you know, I'm really at the germinating stages of, of conceptualizing what that means for not just my practice, but also my engagements with others. You know, again, I think about the Potawatomi basket makers and their work with seed saving, um, really powerful, um, but also on the ground kind of work. Um, but yeah, those are some of my thoughts on the importance of M to M and, and making things public, coming into the public with a feminist practice. So Michelle, do you want to answer uh, that or should uh, I? Yeah, I would just quickly say that um, for me, M to M um, has the same philosophy that I have been trying to push, which is the idea that nobody works alone. Nobody works alone. And um, we have a long history in our country of sort of um, idolizing and elevating, you know, one person and sort of not, you know, giving acknowledgement to all of the other people who were involved in whatever that person um, accomplished. And so, um, and I'm also happy to be able to be part of a community of people who are like minded um, because you know, sometimes up until now, I feel like there's, I haven't had a whole community, um, you know, that, that I can engage with and share ideas with and that kind of thing. So again, I mean, even within M2M, there's a, a level of community. So that's really important and special. Okay, so I'm gonna just ask this question from Anna C, who says, Jeff Rain and Melissa mentioned how capitalism capitalism values, capitalist values, extract and exploitive approaches to people and environment. Today's artists, guests, both center relationships to create things, monumental figures, building murals, garden seeds, paper. How do you see the significance of such things in revaluing labor um, and how it has been devalued and obscured? If you can both weigh in, it's not a simple answer, but just quickly. 
I'll, I'll just quickly say that um, when, when I was working on the Ida B. Wells Monument, um, there was a lot of, um, there was, a, there was a lot of um, environment of thinking, well, okay, if, if we are going to do donate to this monument, then we need to have our name put on it. And all these ideas of like how the donors, major donors, if we're talking like corporate kind of thing, you know, would somehow, in my opinion, kind of own the, the monument. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I felt very strongly against that um, because, you know, this is not about any major corporation saying this is the X corporation monument to Ida B. Wells. This is about the community. Um, and so that made it harder <laughs> to raise money because we needed to have people who thought the same way. Um, and so that idea of who owns um, you know, the work and it shouldn't be the people who financially back it should not feel like they own it. They just should feel like they're supporting it. And so that idea um, was very eye-opening to me and, um, and a little disturbing. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, it's interesting to think too, Michelle, about the way you described something that could become monolithic a uh, monument to a person and how that legacy becomes transferred to a community, something that they feel ownership of. And I think that's sort of the crux, the nexus of what we're talking about. I mean, from, from my perspectives of echo and material feminism, fundamentally, um, I've come to accept and I'm working on in my own practice that nothing is permanent, um, whether we erect a permanent monument or not. These things are always shifting and changing, dying, regenerating, rewilding, coming back to life um, or not. Um, I think M to M um, has uh, embraced that as part of part of the philosophy as well. But I also think that artists work really well in the space of contradiction. Um, you know, there's a contradiction to making more things in a time of climate crisis. There's a contradiction in making a monument in the manner that we are questioning about monoliths, right? So, um, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. I mean, I think one of the things in my teaching, which has been really tough, is that we've become monolithic in our thinking and are not embracing the contradiction. So perhaps a feminist practice is also embracing contradiction and understanding that's sort of the natural order of things um, and that we need to become more ephemeral in the ways that we go through the earth and at the same time, erect the monuments and ideas that will help people transform who they, how they think and who they are. Um, and that's sort of a non-answer answer, but it is the space where I feel like I'm living right now as an artist. Thank you both. That, I mean, it's incredible, all of the things that you're saying, and this should have been a two-hour um, program, and I'm really sorry that it wasn't, although, Michelle, I'm sure you're, you're going to be fielding calls um, for days. Um, I, I just want to remind everyone that the next... Um, M to M live program, Speakeasy is on Tuesday, April 19th, and we will be joined by former Justice LB Sachs, an ANC leader, and the CEO of the Constitutional um, Court Museum, Vanessa September, really talking about next gen democracy. Um, because God knows we really need to talk about the evolution of democracy. And I'll just end with um, really a, a quote from the amazing um, incomparable Bell Hooks that really talks about to be truly visionary, we have to be rooted in our imagination. We have to root, root our imagination in our concrete reality while simultaneously imagining the possibilities beyond that reality. And I think we believe that artists and social justice workers are really creating a reality before it is. We imagine what could be. We are not necessarily living in it and we may not live till the time it happens. But I can say that both of you are deeply engaged in creating a reality before it is a reality. And I think Nisa and I would really like to Deep, deeply thank you for that work. Um, and we are really honored to be within your community. So join us in April. Um, we will paste the link that you can, um, that you can um, 
that you can join with, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, or you can go to M2M's um, website. Um, you also can connect to us through your RSVP that you got for this program. And I thank you all for joining us. Thank really you wonderful. all. Thank you for joining us, everyone. As well as our, a beautiful discussion. Yeah, and our contributors on video, we thank you so much. Maga, Jeffrey, and E. Patrick. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you.